Hey everyone, Chase Ellaby and Joel Williams with Williams Ellaby coming to you today with week number 34 in our series of 52 weeks of personal injury. And today we're going to talk to you about tips for winning at trial. A lot of tips, a lot of topics, but we're going to try to kind of hit on the highlights. So, Yeah, so it's, this is not going to be the video of three to four hours of how to try a case. If you want that, you might need to go somewhere else or wait a while because that video may be coming later on down the pipeline. Today right. is just some tips for helping you be successful at trial. So number one is probably the most obvious is prepare yourself. Um, and by that, I mean prepare yourself with knowledge of all the deposition testimony. Prepare yourself with knowledge of all of the discovery responses. Be intimately familiar with the facts so if you never, you shouldn't ever have to look at a piece of paper at trial other than to introduce it as an exhibit. You should know the facts of that case, like the back of your hand, inside and out, better than anybody else in the room. And that's probably the biggest step you can ever take to being successful at a trial. Yeah, we could probably end the video here and that would be everything you really need to know, but we won't, we keep going. So number two would be to- And everybody just switched to a different video. <laughs> right. Number two would be to subpoena the witnesses, right? So. One kind of trick I learned, not necessarily trick, but don't, from the plaintiff's side, don't always assume that the defendant is actually going to show up to trial. If you're going to call that defendant as a witness, send the defense attorney subpoena to make sure that they're actually at trial, but also to subpoena all your other witnesses that you need to be at trial, because most of the time you're probably going to have already talk to the witnesses, they're going to be friendly in the sense that you can call them and tell them where to be and when, but still subpoenaing the witnesses, make sure that they will show up, they have that you know work excuse. Um, and it also is you know, more official to have them in yep. you know, subpoena. I'd say third, use pretrial motions to your advantage, specifically motions in limine, which are motions you can file ahead of trial to get the judge to rule on whether certain evidence is coming in or certain evidence is coming out or whether you can or cannot go into different um, topics during the trial. And I'm not talking about every lawyer's got these blanket ones that they file all the time. Let me tell you, judges like, zone out, right. go to sleep when they see those. I'm talking about identify the important issues in your case and if there's something that needs to be addressed by the court or can be addressed by the court ahead of time, then file those motions and even if you lose on those motions, at least you know that you've lost on that motion and that evidence is coming in or you're not going to be able to get this evidence in so you can adjust your trial plan accordingly. Right. I said next would be to pre-organize your exhibits, all right? So once you know kind of what evidence is coming in and not coming in, you, with the motions in limine, you sort of anticipate how the court's going to rule, but you should already know what exhibits you're going to use. So make sure they're organized, redacted, if you've got, say, medical records and bills, pre-labeled, pre-marked, and kind of know the order that you're going to admit those records in at trial so you don't lose track, right? And always, you know, we have tr big trial notebooks where everything's super organized. We have exhibit lists and making sure that we admit every single piece of evidence. But yeah, make sure that's all done ahead of time, pre-marked and ready to go. Yep, and if you're using technology, make sure you've got everything scanned in to your local computer so you're not having to rely on internet connections or whatever, especially if you're in a uh, more rural county where you may not have the best uh, technology available in the courtroom. Um, I would say next is identify the important issues in your case and don't be afraid to talk about them during voir dire or jury selection. Um, in my opinion, jury selection is the absolute most important part of a trial because if you don't get a unbiased jury sitting in the jury box, you're done before you even give an opening statement or put a witness on the stand. Um, but you have to be able to have those open, honest dialogues with potential jurors about their feelings on certain issues. One question that uh, an attorney out of Savannah named Jeff Harris uh, told me that I always try to use is ask the jury um, if you were injured in a personal injury case, if you were injured due to the fault of somebody else, would you have any hesitation bringing a lawsuit against them. If somebody would have hesitation, they're probably going to be a bad juror for you as a plaintiff. Um, but then also, like if you're in a med mal case, if you're in an auto wreck case, if you're dealing with back injuries, if you're dealing with pre-existing conditions, if you're dealing with a client that has a checkered past, you need to be able to talk about those issues with the jurors. 
And I'm going to tell you, sometimes you even have to talk about more politically sensitive topics like race issues and gender bias and prejudices and biases against maybe homosexuality or whatever happens to be involved in your case. If you're worried that it might be an issue, it probably is going to be an issue. So you need to talk about it with the jurors and make sure that nobody's left that's gonna have any biases or prejudices against your client. All right, we could probably do like a three week seminar on just jury selection alone. So uh, yeah, that's a very thick topic and it definitely needs to be, you need to prepare just as much for jury selection as you do for the trial itself. So, that's right. Um, I think another you know kind of tip when you're going to, to trials, know what your judge's preferences are, right? Every judge is different. Every judge has their own sort of, you know, style of, voir dire for instance, you know, how they bring the juror or potential jurors in, how they let you ask questions and things like that. So it's always, you know, I think helpful, you know, shoot the uh, staff attorney an email or call up there say, how, do the, how does the judge handle this? How does the judge handle that? So that way you know you don't get in there looking like a rookie and kind of not knowing what's going on. Um, so I think that's very important as well. And go to the courthouse too, right? If you can, if you've never been to that courthouse before and you're going to use technology, See if you can get in there, or at a minimum, find out what sort of technology they have, what the courtroom looks like, where are their TVs, things like that, so you're prepared. Yep. And when you go to the courthouse, if you can, take your client with you, mm -hmm. because your client's going to be on the stand testifying. They've probably never been in that courthouse before, and if you can let them sit in the witness box, and just, even if you're not going through a whole exam, just let them get familiar with the environment that they're going to be in, and they'll pro it'll probably help them be more comfortable and perform better when they're on the stand. Yeah. Um, I would say going back to, I keep going back to preparation, like you said, we could probably end the video there, right. but it's so important. And one reason that preparation is so important is because you've got to be honest with yourself about the challenges in your case. What are the, the I can't get over it issues? Like if you have this one issue in your case that bothers you, it keeps you up at night, you can't figure out how to deal with it, sometimes that's if you're feeling that way the jury's probably feeling that way so i always take the approach of being brutally honest with the juror with with opposing counsel with the court about the good the bad and the ugly in the case and so if you do the preparation ahead of time you know what those challenging issues are going to be and you can deal with them head on and just tell the jury sometimes you know listen we're gonna there's going to be medical records here that show that my client um, had a neck injury 10 years ago, you know, and we're going to be honest with you about that and show you these records and all that. So preparation allows you to be brutally honest with the jury and the court and it builds your credibility. Yeah, exactly. And I think, again, another tip going back to preparation is prepare your client yeah. for direct, right? You know, it's preparing your client doesn't mean you tell them what to say and you're coaching up or, and, you know, any of that type of stuff. Preparing your client is just giving them the knowledge and understanding of what the situation is actually going to be like when they're sitting on the witness stand. Mm -hmm. What sort of questions they can anticipate, what sort of questions they can anticipate from not only the plaintiff's attorney but also the defense lawyer. So it's giving that knowledge and that reassurance, you know, I always tell my clients stick up for yourself, right? If you're being questioned hard, stick up for yourself, be polite, that sort of thing. So you always have to prepare your clients um, for that testimony, for trial and what to expect. Yep. And I would say also on the flip side of direct testimony, when you're getting ready to cross-examine a witness, it should be very directed and succinct. Right. So when, and whenever I'm preparing to cross-examine a witness, I try to write out the story that I'm trying to tell through that witness. And then I just break that story up into leading questions. You're at the intersection of Flowers Avenue and Smith Avenue the night of this wreck, correct? You were driving this car, correct? It was raining, correct? You ran through a red light, correct? Yes, you hit my client when you ran through. So basically what I'm trying to do is tell a story. So I don't have to argue with the witness. I can just tell that story and if all the answers were out, you would have a written narrative, right? Um, but you can only do that through adequate preparation. Um, and so just figure out exactly what information you need to get from this witness and cross-examine them succinctly um, so you don't get off on these tangents and you can control the witness during your cross. Right. And I think another tip too when you're either crossing or directing, you know, so if I'm crossing, oh, let me back up. If I'm directing a client then I sit down and the defense counsel is crossing, you don't have to object at every single question. You don't even have to object when it's something objectionable. 
I always, at least my style, and I know Joel, you're the same way, is that try to limit objections unless it's something that's completely egregious that needs to be objected to. Um, because I don't think it does anyone any favors, right? Because when you object from the plaintiff's side, the jury's probably gonna think, oh, they're hiding something, or why are they objecting, right? It just throws in another wrinkle to the case that a lot of times is not necessary. And a lot of times you're objecting over something that the jury probably didn't even pick up on to begin with, yeah. you know? So I think it's all, be very selective with your objections. Yeah, and you can be more selective with your objections when you file the proper motions and limited prior to trial and just deal with those evidentiary issues ahead of time. Right. Um, I would also say do your best to respect the juror's time. Um, they are there in court, they're taking time out of their lives, they didn't volunteer to be there, they got called in, they're getting paid peanuts to be there. So let them know that you have a duty and you're going to take the time necessary to prove your case, but you're going to try to do it in an efficient manner and respect their time. Um, and most of the time when you do that, they will at least appreciate the fact that you're cognizant of the sacrifices they're making to be at trial. Right, exactly. You know, so at the end of the trial, you always have to do the ask, right? You always have to ask the jury for a monetary award for the damages that were caused. Yeah. So it's always important when you make that ask that one, you believe in the actual number that you're asking <laughs> and that the case is actually yeah. worth that, right? So if you're gonna get up there and ask for $10 million, and you don't believe that the case is worth $10 million? The jury the, doesn't either. The jury does not either, that's exactly right. So you've got to really think hard about the ask, and a lot of times when we're preparing for trial, you kind of have an idea of what you think that ask is going to be, and then you go through trial, you go through the, the evidence, the testimony, things like that, and it completely changes, you know, for good or bad, right? Good meaning you're asked for more, bad you're gonna ask for less. But you want to make sure that the ask is a fair number based on the evidence, and something that's not gonna completely shock the jury into thinking this guy or gal is completely unreasonable or being just ridiculous. So it's a tough thing to do, but you know, you really have to think long and hard about what that ask is going to be. Yeah, and if you're a plaintiff's lawyer, just be careful and don't let your ego get in the way because we all see the really large verdicts, but every case is not set up to be one of those really large verdicts. Okay. We have to try $10,000 cases. We have to try $10 million cases than anything and everything in between, right? And if you've got a $100,000 case and you ask for $10 million, you're probably gonna get $0 right. um, or a very small verdict. So just make sure the ask is adjusted to the facts of the case. Um, I would also say in your preparation, try to make sure that you do not build in any appealable issues. Right. Nobody benefits from an appeal other than maybe appellate attorneys that get hired to come in and handle that part of the case, right? Um, be aware of sticky issues, unsettled areas of the law as you go into trial, and make sure that if there's something that you need to get into that um, might build an appeal, you make an educated decision as to whether you're actually going to get into that. You're right. That's exactly. What I was going to say, you know, don't don't dig in your heels for the sake of digging in your heels. If you know the judge rules your way, that there could potentially be an appealable issue, mm -hmm. especially if you feel like the trial is going your way and you might get a good outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say kind of, we, we talked about a little bit with evidence and things like that on motion and lemony side. Know how to deal with that evidence too that yeah. you know is going to come in. That's another tip. You know, you might know, it kind of goes back to, you know, being brutally honest and things like that when you're, you know, in your opening and in your direct and things like that, you know, in your direct with your client about, you use the example of having a neck injury 10 years ago. Know those bad facts, know what evidence is going to come in or even potential what evidence is going to come in and know how to guard against that. And it might be something you have to object to. A lot of times in, you know, you're kind of run of the mill car wreck case, defense attorneys might try to bring in evidence that, you know, of a prior uh, medical visit that the records aren't authenticated or they haven't been produced. And you'll need to know the evidence rules and know whether or not that they can actually get into that and for what purpose they're getting into that for, whether it's impeachment or you know whether or not it's to prove that that actually occurred. So, yeah. um, those are some pretty that's some pretty thorough tips. I know it's sort of the ten thousand foot view. Um, one other thing, it, don't forget about the little things. Um, I like to take a tackle box, literally a fishing tackle box, with us when we go try a case. It's going to have everything in there from pens and markers and a stapler and whiteout um, to ibuprofen. I'm probably going to put some snack bars in there. Uh, something 
anything and everything that could be minor batteries, but if my mouse or my computer dies, you know, all those little things that could be a disaster if you don't have it at trial, just make sure you kind of think ahead and try to anticipate any minor issues that could come up. You get a headache, take some right. ibuprofen or Tylenol or whatever. Um, and you know what you would need for your specific issue. Um, because anything and everything will happen. I was trying to case with a lady one time in Tennessee. We were walking down the sidewalk, she was wearing heels, and her heel got stuck in a grate and it broke her heel off. So she had to break the other heel off, you know, and go in and try the case. But, um, you know, things like that happen. Right. And you can't always prepare for everything, but just try to keep in mind those little things that might come up um, and prepare for it in advance. Just like you're preparing yourself with the knowledge, you're preparing yourself and the court with the motions in limine to know what's going on in the trial, you're preparing your witnesses. So, like you said at the beginning of this video, prepare, 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 right. and you're, you have taken a huge step to being successful. That's right. So that's gonna wrap it up for our overview of tips to help you be successful at trial. Uh, if this video has been helpful to you, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, otherwise we'll see you next week as we continue with our series of 52 weeks of personal injury.